This morning on Wake Up With Hope, Living in the Kitchen is back with another health segment on avocados and almonds. We will have music by the Collingsworth family, a short artistic talk on the 95 Theses, and an inspirational devotional thought from Pastor John Bradshaw, Don't Go Anywhere. Good morning and happy Wednesday and welcome to a new episode of Wake Up With Hope. Good morning to you friends on this lovely National Great Outdoors Month. June is typically a perfect month to get outside and enjoy nice weather in the sunshine. And did you know that sunlight is essential to our health? Not only does it support healthy vitamin D levels, which is crucial, but it has other benefits as well. In fact, we'd like to share a few of those with you. That's right. Sunlight kills bacteria. Sunlight may reduce high blood pressure. Hmm. You know, sunlight can regulate the immune system. Sunlight can strengthen our bones. Hmm. Sunlight can improve sleep quality. And sunlight can help combat mood disorders as it boosts our mood. Hmm. You know, what a wonderful reminder for us to get outdoors and soak in some sunshine. That's right, and don't forget to stay close to the sun, S-O-N, Jesus, so that he can shine his light in us. Oh, I like that. You know, we hope that our program today will help you get closer to Jesus as you abide in him. You know, we have a lot in store today, so let's begin by taking a look back at what happened on this day in history. On June 7, 1913, Hudson stuck. An Alaskan missionary led the first successful ascent of Denali formerly known as Mount McKinley, the highest point on the American continent at 20,320 feet. Denali is not necessarily known for being dangerous or difficult, but one of the most dangerous things about Denali is that besides being the highest point and a massive mountain, it's very far north and thus inherently cold, brutally cold year round. The barometric pressure is incomparable to any of its counterparts. Of the more than 35,000 people that have attempted to climb Denali, only a few have actually reached the top. It takes approximately two weeks to get to the top and any hiker attempting it should be prepared to experience nausea, vomiting, and a lack of appetite. Hmm. You know, some of us may hear this and wonder, why would anyone go through all this just to climb to the top of a mountain? Well, the truth is that we all have an inner sense of wanting to accomplish or achieve something great and noteworthy. You know, we all want to be known for something. So friends, what is it with you? What legacy do you want to leave behind? What are your goals in life? You know, sometimes it's easy to go through life and forget about our goals and vision. As we strive for the ultimate goal of being a part of the heavenly kingdom, we encourage you to reassess your life and determine if your life goals and your daily activities are getting you closer to that kingdom. You know, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. So we can start now to live a life of peace, joy, and love as we walk with him now. Amen. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. What do avocados and almonds have to do with hmm. weight loss? Good question. Yes, let's find out on today's Live It program. With two-thirds of our population either overweight or obese, the emphasis tends to be on what you should not eat. Oh, man. However, when it comes to losing weight, instead, ask yourself, what should I eat? Obesity is a huge problem in America. It increases one's risk of heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, high blood pressure, cancer, and the list goes on. So let's focus on two foods that we should eat if we want to lose weight avocados and almonds. Researchers added half of an avocado to the subject's lunch meals and found that they felt fuller over a longer period of time and had less of a desire to eat. 
Not only that, but their insulin levels mm. decreased after the meal. A lot of people think that because avocados are high in fat, that they are fattening. But that is not necessarily so, because higher fat foods help you feel full. You see, avocados contain monounsaturated fat. It's a healthy type of fat that our bodies need to reduce LDLs. That's the bad cholesterol in our blood. This fruit also contains 20 vitamins and minerals. And almonds have a similar effect. The high protein, high fat, and high fiber content in these nuts help us feel more full. In fact, the researcher found in a weight control program that those who ate almonds as a snack had longer and better sustained weight reduction than those in the popcorn group. The study also found that people do not gain weight by eating a handful of almonds every day. But more than losing weight, it's what these foods do to help combat the negative health effects of obesity. So how should we incorporate avocados and almonds into our daily diet? My recommendation would be about half an avocado. So to substitute that too for maybe some of the butter or the high fat cheese that is usually consumed at meal times. And for almonds, eat a handful a day. You can also substitute it for saturated fats like cheese and meat for added health benefits. And that liven up your diet by being creative with these foods. For example, instead of putting butter on your toast, top it with almond butter or avocado. You can even make a delicious avocado shake with almond milk. For a healthier take on dessert, make chocolate pudding with avocado instead of the dairy. Then top it with slivered almonds. There's your tip for the day on how you can live healthier longer. In the Luther House of Wittenberg hangs a stark painting. There is Luther, a bunch of academics, poor people on the street, some monks running away with money, and a small poster outlining objections Luther had with the church. The painting shows the start of a movement that changed the face of the Christian world. Let's dig deeper with Neil Schofield on today's episode of Masterstroke. In the Luther House of Wittenberg hangs a painting by Julius Hubner. It depicts the day Martin Luther marched to the doors of the castle cathedral. He nailed 95 objections to the selling of indulgences and the assumed role of the Pope. In the center, Luther has a Bible under his arm. To his left is a group of excited students. But on his right is a church scholar doing all he can to hose down joy among the onlookers. Up the front is a rotund monk. He has his hand being kissed in worship. Then we have a mother, her child, and a cripple in the centre. This is to point out church responsibilities to help the poor. Meanwhile, we have a monk running from the scene and he's got a money box under his arm. did Luther gain such a strong conviction on these issues? Well, Luther began as an earnest monk. He once said, if ever a monk could win heaven by monkery, I must have reached it. <laughs> but as he compared the Bible with the teachings of the church, he was horrified. One of the issues that most upset him was the selling of indulgences. The way it worked was this. The poor Christian paid money to the church and in return, the punishment for his sin was downgraded or taken away. A German rhyme went this way. Place your penny on the drum, the pearly gates open and in strolls mum. For me, this painting, it's not just about Martin Luther or nailing objections to a door. This painting is the turning point in Christianity. It's a turning towards the Bible and the Bible only. As he faced hostile church leadership, Luther said, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything. 
since it's neither safe nor right to go against my conscience. May God help me. Amen. If you're enjoying today's show, share it with a friend or visit our website at hopetv.org slash wake up to see more exciting content. And friends, don't forget to check our YouTube channel. Simply search for Wake Up With Hope and keep up with each one of our episodes. That's right. You know, we hope you're enjoying our time with us this morning, but we have to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to have inspiring music. And later, John Bradshaw from It Is Written will be encouraging us with the spirit-filled message. So stay with us. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. It's now time to share a blessing in song. Enjoy. If you're enjoying today's program like we are, please share it with your friends. Our website is hopetv.org slash wake up. Coming right up after the break, Pastor John Bradshaw from It Is Written is going to share a thoughtful message from the Bible with us. 
Welcome back to our program, friends. How are you enjoying it this morning? Send us a message on Facebook and let us know. This morning, John Bradshaw from It Is Written is with us to share a reflective message from the Bible. Hey there, great to see you. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written, really hoping that your day has started well, that you've got great plans for the day, or if not, your plans have been surrendered to God and you are confident that He is going to lead you and make your life today great and special and blessed. 1984, the Winter Olympics were held in the city of Sarajevo. Sarajevo, that's in Bosnia and Herzegovina, one country, not two. That's the same year that the Summer Olympics were held in Los Angeles, California. Sarajevo is a great place. I've been there. Fascinating. It's an interesting blend of cultures. Uh, it's, it's in part uh, a very Muslim city. At the same time, it's a very Christian city. Uh, I don't know about the professions and the practices, but we're talking about the demographics here. And so it's a fascinating blend of cultures and food. Ooh, good food in Sarajevo. Just a great place. I loved being there. I traveled there a few years ago. We filmed an It Is Written television program uh, in Sarajevo. And what I found interesting is that we went to the Luge course uh, from the 1984 Olympic Games. So we were there, uh, say, 35 years or so after the Olympic Games were held. And so you wonder, what happens to these facilities? Do they use them again and again and again? Well, I don't know, maybe they used it again, but Sarajevo, not long after that, was the home or the host to a really unfortunate war. I don't want to minimize that, nor do I want to maximize that, but a terrible, terrible war that raged throughout that land. And because of that and other factors, the Olympic facilities fell into disrepair and ruin. So. We visited the Luge. You understand what I mean, Luge. It's, it's a track. It goes this way and that way and zooms around. And these crazy competitors lay down or recline on perilously small boards and they scoot across the ice at breakneck speeds. It's a fun sport to watch. I imagine it would be absolutely terrifying to participate in. But today you can visit the old Luge track. When we were there, uh, there were groups of young people spraying graffiti on the luge track. They explained to us they came there often. They said it was their playground. No one rides the luge or anything like that now. It'd be wildly unsafe and, and it, it, the track is disused. It's in ruins. And that's what happens at times. Things fall into disrepair. Old stuff ends up being ruined. If it's not restored, if it's not kept, if it's not maintained, if it's not used and utilized, it ends up as ruins. So that was Sarajevo and the Winter Olympics facilities. But in addition to that, on the banks of Lake Tuscaming, where's Lake Tuscaming? If you know, then you've done really well. Lake Tuscaming is 250 miles north, thereabouts, of Toronto, Canada. On the banks of Lake Tuscaming, it's about 115 square miles, the lake. It's as pretty as a picture. There is a mansion. And when I say mansion, it's a mansion. 65,000 square feet. It's not a McMansion. You see those on uh, uh, subdivisions from sea to shining sea. This is the real thing. 65,000 square feet. It sits on 43 acres on the lake. It's spectacular. Well, no, wait. It was meant to be spectacular. In 2008, however, the global financial crisis caught up with the gentleman the business magnate who intended to build this mansion, and he wasn't able to finish the job. So it sits there today in ruins, essentially. Now, it's not abject ruins and complete ruins, but when people find out about these things, of course, they go in there and do damage and windows are smashed and things are so forth. The, the, the building wasn't very far from completion. I mean, you look at it today and you might not even know if you saw from a distance that it was in ruins and disused. What a waste, eh? What an unfortunate thing. This would-be beautiful, well, extravagant building is in ruins. It's sitting there. What its future is, I don't know, and I don't know who does know, but it speaks to something. I don't say this to find fault about the builder. His intentions were good. His cash flow wasn't nearly as good as he would have liked it to have been, though. And when his businesses were pinched by the GFC, then building stopped on his castle, mansion. Look with me at what 
Luke wrote, these are the words of Jesus, and he's reading from verse, or he's speaking, I'm reading, from verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. No, Jesus isn't promoting hatred for your kinfolks. He is saying, if you don't love them less than you love Jesus and the things of heaven, that's, that's, that's what the language intimates there. He says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So, you know, churches are full of people today who want to be Christians, but uh, churches filled with people who want to carry the cross. And there are people who maybe aren't Christians, maybe you're one of them, and you're thinking about Christianity. Well, the truth is, and the privilege is, there's a cross to bear. It's not made out of balsa wood either. It's the real thing. Jesus said in verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, a mansion maybe, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest, after he has finished the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and wasn't able to finish. Jesus is saying here, if you're going to build something, you want to have the means, the wherewithal to finish the project. Otherwise, it looks kind of funny to have a half completed 65,000 square foot mansion on the edge of a beautiful lake, standing as a testament to your inability to finish the job. So what is it with Christians? Well, we want to finish the job, except, of course, what that means is we want to allow Jesus to finish the job. Christianity is about seeing it through to the end. Oh, I don't mean with bloody mindedness and stubbornness. No one here is talking about salvation by works, but faith hangs in there and lets Jesus do the job. Faith doesn't bail on the Savior. Faith doesn't quit. Faith doesn't give up because your faith, listen, is not in you. Your faith isn't even in your faith, but your faith is in the great God who stretched out the heavens and festooned them with beautiful, bright, twinkling stars and planets, nebulae, galaxies. This is what faith does. It hangs on to that one. So if you're in, temptations come. Wait, can you get through this? Do you have the wherewithal to finish the job as a Christian? Yes, you do, and I'm going to tell you why because you have faith in Jesus and the Bible speaks of him. This is, I think, in terms of righteousness by faith, one of the most profound verses you'll find in all of the Bible. It says in Philippians 1 and verse 6 that he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus is doing the work. He'll get it done. Do you have what it takes to finish the project of your salvation, your character development, your faith in Jesus. Yes, you do have what it takes to get that done because you have faith in Christ and it's Christ who will get it done. Today, hold on to that Jesus. You want to finish this. If you feel your faith is weak, you don't need a lot of faith, just a little faith in a great big strong God. That's all faith like a grain or like a mustard seed, just a little. Have faith today. He'll get the job done. You don't want to bail on Jesus, quit or fall back. Hang on to Jesus. He will see you through today. Thank you, Pastor John, for those words of encouragement. And friends, thank you for watching Wake Up With Hope. Now, don't forget to visit our website at hopetv.org slash wake up to learn more about what we have going on. And be sure to tune in tomorrow, friends. We will have a special feature on the seven deadly psychological sins with Dr. Jennifer Jill Schwerzer, and we will have music by Resonance. Plus, we will have an inspiring morning devotional and more. If you enjoyed today's message, visit hope.study to receive your free Bible study guides designed with you in mind. We hope you didn't miss that. Again, that's hope. Dot study. We know you're going to be blessed and very encouraged. And before we go, we have a Bible promise we want to send home with you. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. And it says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. 
It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Mm, amen. What a beautiful promise and reminder that we no longer need to live, you know, empty lives. You know, friends, we can have hope today and we hope you have a wonderful day. We can't wait to see you tomorrow. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven today, Lord, we claim the blood of the Lamb to cleanse us from all our sin, to know that we are redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And we pray, Lord, that this, this truth, this fact, will give us hope throughout this entire day. Thank you for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.